every all of that was serving people and serving people with dignity. If you ever get a chance that you should read a book called Toxic Charity, it's it's really an eye opening book about the fact that we would be so much better to give people the ability to participate in their own in their own uh, upliving versus just pulling them up our way. Hey, we're going to give you this. We're going to create this program. What about doing it with people? What about giving people a chance to participate? And that's a really fantastic book that shaped how I thought about a lot of this stuff. Well, what's interesting as you're saying that and thinking of my children, we have them on this like youthpreneur path, right? Like they've been starting businesses and really having conversations about generational wealth and real estate and investments. And every day they get in the car, they're like, what did my investment count do today? Right. And it's, you know, another layer to education that most people don't think about. People want my husband's plan for it. I'm sure one day he'll work it out. I'll make it into an e-course because he's never going to do something like that. Yeah. But he's talking about, you know, the exposure to conversations like this at an early, early age and the change that it could take place for generations to come. And we talk about generational wealth or generational ties to that. But there is this book that was brought to my attention from Oprah's Soul podcast I was listening to even just this morning. And she was talking about uh, a book called, um, oh gosh, it's on the tip of my tongue, uh, Die, Die Broke or Die With Zero. Die With Zero is the name of the book. And the, the premise is, is that we should actually be spending the investments that we have now rather than um, holding it to this point that when you get to your deathbed, you never hear someone regret uh, how much money they did or didn't spend, right? I spent too much money. I wish I had more maybe to give to my kiddos. But ultimately, it's like there is more that could have been done with your life knowing that you have all of this holding cell for people. And to keep, teach my kids to do it now, to teach our, that youth generation now allows us not to carry this crazy burden that they're not going to be able to later because they already have this lens. Talk to me about like accruing a financial gain over the longevity of your life and what that looks like for either your kiddos or generations or maybe just the life you're living now. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thought. You know, um, I have a little mini course that I teach on the five money thoughts that keep people poor. And one of them is you can't take it with you when right. you're gone. Right. And, and, and the fact is that is totally true. You cannot take it with you. There are no bank vaults following the hearse. Right. But it's very one sided and maybe a little bit intellectually dishonest. Right. And that is you can't take it with you, but you sure can empower the people you leave behind. Yeah. Right. You sure can uh, take care of the causes that you care about. You can use your wealth and your resources for more than you. And so that's one of the uh, most interesting things. You know, my wife and I um, have been in the process for a little bit of setting up a foundation um, because one of the things that we love to do is we love to do outsource giving, right? So we give to our church and we give to other organizations, but, you know, it's paying a light bill somewhere and who knows what. And one of the things we like to do is find a need and meet that need directly. And so one of the things foundations allow you to do is you can actually give into the foundation and deduct that from whatever tax year you're giving it in, in total. But you actually only need to spend out 5% of that money that's in the foundation every year. So if the money is well managed, theoretically, that foundation continues to grow. And let's say you were giving away 50,000 a year to random causes or 100,000 a year, you can make some difference there, right? Yeah. But piling that in a foundation where you're earning interest and only having to deploy certain pieces of it at certain times, you end up creating a sustainable ministry tool, right? Where eventually yeah. the interest yeah. on that foundation yeah. is more than the actual principle you would yeah. be giving. And you can do legacy projects. You can make enormous differences Instead of spreading an, a, a, a mile wide and an inch deep, you can make very concerted use of that. So, you know, one of the things that that we've set as a is a goal. We we've got a number that we're working towards, and that number is far more than we'll ever need in our lifetime, or our kids will probably ever need in their lifetime. And the way that our trusts are set up, too, Tamara, is we want to empower our kids. We don't want to handicap them. Yeah. And so, so what does that mean? The way that they're going to distribute that money, should my wife and I not be here, they're going to be comfortable 
They're going to be able to do what they want to do in life, not what they might have to do in life. But they're also not going to be able to do nothing. Yes, life, yes. Right. So, so it's going to it's time. going to distribute to them over yeah. time and at certain milestones. And it's going to basically force them into being productive members of society while also maintaining some of the legacy that we're able to to build, to distribute, you know, hopefully for hundreds of years after we're gone. Yeah. And I, that was a huge component of like new information that when we were building, we, we, it's a trust the way that we set it up for our family and every, you know, every property we have is its own LLC and then it's held underneath this trust. And having the access point at certain ages, I just never even thought about like when they turn 18, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's all going to go to hell in a handbasket if it's handed to one child. The other child might actually duplicate and multiply as they're intended. But, you know, it's just depending. I think anybody coming into something like that, especially under um, pressures of society or pressures of personality, it could ruin them. We hear yeah. it all the time with people who hit the lottery, right? Or yeah. NFL players and things and what happens with them. Well, it's the process. Analogy. It's yeah. the process that that makes us strong enough to bear the weight of success and influence. It's actually the lifting. It's like that old adage of helping a butterfly out of its cocoon. You see this butterfly struggling to get out. You think, well, I want to help it. This looks so hard. It's yeah. struggling. Let me help it. So you open up the cocoon and the butterfly gets out faster. It's easier, except the butterfly can't actually fly because its wings never gain the strength to support itself that were needed and would have been cultivated through the struggle of coming out of it. And that's what you see. You see a lot of people who who are not prepared for that level of blessing and the blessing actually becomes a burden because they didn't earn the right to hold that through the process of becoming somebody capable of managing you see it with sports players you see it with lottery people i mean you see all sorts of people who did not have to learn the rules of money in order to get that money and it becomes a problem in their life because they it's out of place they don't know how to handle it they don't know how to steward it yeah and i think honestly like this whole conversation has really been around stewardship even even the stewardship of his word to you when you stepped out in obedience from the church and in that prompting and that calling I'm curious from how you show up in the world now in all of these different facets, real estate, investment, you know, intellectual property, you're an author, you're a speaker. Um, how do you infuse the other lens or fruits of the spirit into how you activate on a daily basis? Yeah, that's a that's a, a, an interesting thing. One of my favorite quotes that I heard early in my walk with the Lord that just has always stuck with me is preach always, use words only when necessary. Yeah. And one, one of the ways I've tried to live my life is I've tried to be an example of Christ as best I can. Listen, we all fail. We all fall short. None of us is perfect. I'm far from perfect. You can ask my wife. <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> but, um, but man, listen, you know, one of the things I've tried to do every single day for 15 years is show up and do the best that I can be a good steward of my time, work as unto God, be fair to people, be good to people, treat people well. And you know what? I have uh, had the honor of leading a whole lot more people to the Lord through my business ventures than I ever had working for a church because I'm out where people are. I'm out where people's needs are. You come face to face with hurting people, broken people, lost people, people who need some direction, people who need an ear, people who need a total change in life. And they look at you, say, say, where's that joy come from? How are you able to stay so calm amidst these challenges? Why aren't you responding like anybody else I've ever seen? Why did you, why did you do that when you didn't have to do it? And that has been sort of my MO for the last 15 years is, man, I hope my life speaks uh, volumes that my words would never speak. And like I said, man, I've, I've messed up so many times. I know you messed up so many times. Everybody listening, we're not perfect, but we can get up every day and we can try to be the hands and feet of Jesus because the truth is some of us are the only Jesus anybody's ever going to see out there. And so, you know, can we be good to people? Can we treat people right? Can we be honest with them? Even when it hurts us, can we do those things? And I think that that's, the, that's really what's, I've tried to do showing up for the last 15 years. 
Yeah, I think that there's just that sense of nobility, but I can hear like, I can hear humility in the way that you speak, which is really powerful, especially when people are speaking to accolades or, or versions of themselves that they had not even embodied until they got there, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can even perceive the kind of places that you've shown up or the, the people that you've got to be in conversations with. And I just think it's such a grace on your life and on your family for you to be able to step into that. And so I just want to just pray vocally out loud for that continued abundance and oh, prosperity you. over you guys. Absolutely. You know, I, I always tell people, Tamara, I feel like I'm, I'm a turtle on a fence post. I didn't get there on my own. I've been <laughs> surrounded by unbelievable people. No, seriously, I've been surrounded by unbelievable people. And, um, you know, God's just been exceedingly good to us. You know, I got saved when I was 19. I was running 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction. And he changed my life dramatically. I mean, just absolutely dramatically. And, um, and listen, you know, it's, it's, it's just something that I understand. I didn't get here by myself. <laughs> it could all go away tomorrow. And, um, and so that's one of the things that is something that's always been important to me is remember where you came from. Remember where it came from. Remember who you are and remember whose you are. 